Our next, next speaker, Rob Lilwall, he was so nice. He sent me something to help me do the introduction. And I have to say, I had some doubts about that. He started, he told us, like, well, Rob, he is a very ordinary guy. And I have to say, before I come to this room, I researched him. I was looking at his documentary. I was like, what? Do you say that ordinary? He is originally from the UK. So before he came to Hong Kong, he was teaching geography at a local high school in an English town, beautiful English town. And then his life started to take off into an unusual course, and I'm pretty sure everyone of you here knows that pretty well. So he went on this course that is full of facing fears and embracing challenges. National Geogra Geographic made two series on his experience and his two adventures. And today he's gonna share about us. With those experiences, he's been given inspirational speech all around the world for tens of thousands of people, and also including corporate clients like HSBC, Prudential, Tom's Rotas, Adidas, Hyatt, you name it. And today, I think, and he said in the script, literally, he said, I think you're gonna enjoy it. I was like, I think? I'm sure you're gonna enjoy it, right? Yes. Yes, Rob, the stage is yours. Let's start with this. When I was at school as a child, I was the child in the class who never put his hand up. I was very, very shy, but actually I always really wanted to put my hand up, but I never could. I was, I was too shy to do it. And that made me feel really bad about myself. Uh, and I started to think that maybe my whole life is going to be determined by the things I'm afraid of. And then um, I went to university, and then after university I got my first proper job. And I think even then I was still too insecure to try and get a job like out in the big kind of growing up world. So I, my first job I got was a geography high school teacher. And I was teaching uh, children all about the world, teaching them about the rivers and mountains and um, civilizations of our planet. Um, there I am, geography teacher. Um, <laughs> But after I'd been teaching geography for a couple of years, I, um, I realized I needed to go out and really do something to make myself grow up. I really needed to test myself to try and grow up. And in the meantime, I'd started going on some short adventures on my bicycle, sort of cycling around England and things. Then I decided I need to go on a really, really big bicycle ride to really grow up. So I ended up buying myself a one-way plane ticket and I flew from London all the way across the world to northeast Russia. And my plan was, I thought it would be more fun, rather than starting from England and cycling off into the world, it would be more fun if I start as far away from home as possible and then try and cycle back again. So when I landed there, got off the plane, I took my bicycle, I started cycling, and this is the route I took to get home. Um, see not a very straight line. Um, <laughs> so just um, so I can get to know you all a little bit better, I've got three questions for you. Uh, so just answer by putting your hand up. Um, so question one, you ready? Uh, question one, who would like to go on a journey like this on their bicycle? Okay, that's good. Okay, that's about a quarter of the like that. Okay, slightly different question. Um, who thinks they could do a journey like this? Not that you want to, but if you had to, who thinks you'd make it home? Who thinks you'd make it home? Okay, that's getting a bit better. That's about half of you. Um, question three. Um, who here thinks I look like a really tough guy? <laughs> okay, thank you for that question. Um, but it, it, it's true, I, I am not a very tough guy at all. I was never in my <coughs> top sports teams at school. Um, I'm, I'd say I'm kind of average intelligence. And as I've already admitted to you, I'm not a very brave person. I, I get frightened of things 
very, very easily. But what I found on this journey was it wasn't about being super strong or super brainy or super brave. It was about kind of the attitudes I chose day by day. And our attitudes are very much things we can choose. We're not born with them. Um, and I learned um, things like um, if you uh, face your fears, if you kind of make yourself face fears, gradually they get less. And often the things you're afraid of aren't as bad as you thought they were. I learned that when you're going through a really tough time, as I often did, if you keep going, you get out the other side and things get easier again. It's easier just to keep going and you get through it. Um, I learned that there's lots of very kind people in the world and often when you ask for help, um, you um, people will want to help you. Or if they can't help you, they'll want to introduce you to somebody else who will help you. Uh, and it was just an amazing, amazing learning experience. I, I, I was very rewarded by this experience just by what I learned. But um, I also had some unexpected rewards. Uh, I think the, the biggest reward by far was actually when I cycled, you see, when I cycled through Hong Kong about a year into the journey. Um, and I was waiting, I was looking for a boat to take me down south towards Australia. And I met a beautiful girl in a bar in Causeway Bay at a friend's party. And we got on very well. And uh, when I got back to England, I married her. So I even. Um, and um, then there were, there were other kind of unexpected rewards. When I got home, I thought I would probably just be go back to being a geography teacher. I still was kind of quite an insecure person in many ways, despite this journey. Um, but then a publisher got in touch, and they asked me to write a book, so I ended up writing my first book. And then National Geographic got in touch, and they wanted to make a TV show about the journey, so, so that happened. And then I started, um, at the same time as all this, started giving speeches. And um, it, it kind of grew, and originally I was speaking in, mainly in schools, um, and then I, I started getting invited to the corporates. And now um, I, I fly all over the world speaking to these big companies, and it's kind of become my job, is being a professional adventurer of ISO TV speaking. And that was kind of the last thing I ever would have expected. And it's kind of ironic, isn't it? I started off as this shy person, um, and then it's ended up kind of making me uh, face my fears. And I've had to speak a lot in public. But it, again, it's funny how when you keep facing your fears, they do gradually um, get easier. But I think there's another irony I've noticed in this, and, and that was that even though I was now this, you know, I suppose you could say it's quite a kind of glamorous job I had, speaking and flying around and writing books, but actually inside I still felt very insecure. And I think often some of the most successful people you meet who look very successful on the outside, I think often they're very insecure inside and they're, they're kind of pushing themselves hard to try and overcome their insecurities in a way. Um, uh, and um, my chief insecurity was really that I felt like I did that great adventure, and now I'm speaking about it all over the world and so on. But uh, I think I need to do another adventure, because otherwise I'm just always talking about that thing from before. So I started going on new adventures. Um, I went, I, I walked, did a walk in the Middle East. I rode a bicycle across America. I did a big walk in China and Mongolia. Um, and that brings us up to really the main story I'm going to tell you today, which was about um, a year and a half ago, I thought now it's time for a new adventure. The bicycle ride now is about 10 years ago. I did a bunch of other things. And then about a year and a half ago, I was starting to think about my next journey. And I started looking at a map of China. I live in Hong Kong now, so I'm um, based you know, on the edge edge of China, um, and I started thinking, I want to go on a new expedition in China, and I started looking at this map, and I sort of looked around, I like China, and then my eyes were drawn to this. Did anyone ever notice that quite big deserty patch? Anyone know, what, what, what's the name of that desert? Anyone know? Somebody said, go, who here thinks it's the Gobi Desert? Who thinks it's the Gobi Desert? Few of you think so. Often, I think people, when they think of big desert around China somewhere, they think Gobi. It's a famous desert. This one is actually not, not nearly as famous. So there we are, zoomed in. Um, but it's a very extraordinary desert. It's huge. It's the second biggest sand desert in the world. Yet most people haven't heard of its name. It's called uh, the Paklamakan Desert. And I started researching this and thinking, this looks quite an interesting desert. It's so big, second biggest sand desert in the world. I found out it's also got quite a frightening 
reputation. Um, sometimes it's just called the desert of death. Sorry, um, and then sometimes um, uh, it's translated as he who goes in won't come out. <laughs> um, and so as I recently, and then I found a book, there aren't very many books about it, but I found this one book about it, um, and the book was called uh, The Worst Desert on Earth. So. <laughs> um, and um, this book, it was written by a guy called Charles Blackmore, Major Charles Blackmore, who was a guy from the British Army, and about 20 years ago, he led the first and only ever expedition to have successfully crossed this desert. Um, and he took with him a, a team of 15 people, mixture of British and Chinese, and 30 camels. And it took them about two months to cover a thousand kilometers. They had all sorts of difficulties on the way, very, very dangerous. But eventually, uh, they made it out the other side to become the first team in history to have done that. Um, but then as I, I, I was thinking, wow, only one team's ever done it. Um, and nobody has ever done it alone. This is uh, an opportunity to do something nobody has ever done. So I'm thinking maybe I can try and do that. Uh, and then as I thought about it, I thought, um, camels, you know camels? Um, I don't know much about camels. I do know that they tend to like bite you, spit at you, <laughs> generally disdain you. Um, and every few days you have to dig a hole, about a two meter deep hole in the desert to look for the sort of salty water down low and the camels can drink that. So there's a lot of digging, a lot of work. So I thought, I don't want to take camels. What about if I tried a sort of pioneer the new technique, which would be dragging my stuff in some kind of sled or something behind me. I can drag what I need across. Um, and so that was starting to be my plan. It felt like a bit of a crazy plan. So I um, thought I need to talk to somebody who actually knows this desert really well, can tell me whether this idea is feasible. I thought, who, who can I talk to? And I thought, there's only one person I can really think of, and that's Major Charles Blackmore. So I found him on LinkedIn. He was in, I was going to London to give a speech, and so I, I arranged to meet him. And I expected that when I, I thought when I tell him my plan, I expected that he would probably say, Rob, it's a terrible idea. Whatever you do, don't do it. And actually, I think I secretly hoped he would say that. <laughs> <laughs> then I would have a good excuse not to do it. But so I sat down, had a coffee, explained the idea, and then he said, Rob, it's a brilliant idea. You've got to do it. I said, really? And he said, yeah, you've got to do it. Um, oh, here he is. Um, and uh, so I thought, oh, uh, okay. And then I went, I came back to Hong Kong, and me and Christine were talking about it. And I, I said to Christine, well, if I do it, um, you know, I think it will take at least a year to get ready. So I'll do it kind of all next autumn in, 20, in the following year. Um, but then we found out, um, much to our delight, uh, we were expecting a baby. And we'd been wanting to have children for ages. And, um, and suddenly, we were expecting a baby, which was brilliant news. But it made me think, wow, if I'm going to do this trip, I've got to do it before the baby arrives. That means I've got to do it this year. I've got to start in August. And so I started to get planning. And uh, Charles Blackmore, when he did this expedition, he spent two years planning and spent a million dollars, a million US dollars. I had four months to plan, and I had $10,000. So rather than a different situation, I ordered a sled off Amazon. Christine sat on it. Uh, we live in Mui Wao on Lantau. So I started pulling the, the sled up and down the beach with her to give some weight. And after just one sort of length of the beach, I realized I was exhausted, and it was far too difficult. Terrible, terrible idea. But we didn't give up. We um, found some wheels on uh, um, Amazon, which um, work on the sand. So we went to um, Kowloon, that's Mr. Locke, who uh, his day job is basically building kitchen trolleys. But we persuaded him to make us a cart, we put the wheels on, and I went back to the beach, and a bunch of children were watching me, and I said, jump on! So I uh, put the children on the beach to have the weight, and it worked perfectly. Um, it's amazing, these wheels worked on the sand. I was also busy getting fit, um, and there were some other preparations to do. Uh, something that made the expedition easier now than 20 years ago is that there are now some oil roads. You see these lines. They're oil roads going north-south through the desert. So I realized I couldn't carry, you know, a thousand kilometers worth of food and water. And so I hid. I, before I set off, I, I hired a car and I drove around hiding in each of these dots. I hid a stash of food and water. So the plan would be to start here, walk along here, going from um, cache to cache.
to get across picking up the supplies on the way. Um, I should also say that the Takramakan is in Xinjiang province. In Xinjiang province in western China, it's quite a politically sensitive part of China. It's a little bit like Tibet, except it's not Buddhist, it's Muslim. So it's kind of politically sensitive. The government there kind of are quite strict about tourists and foreigners and stuff. Um, and what I was planning to do, it wasn't illegal, but let's just say if I had asked permission, the government would have said no. So I couldn't ask permission. I knew I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but I thought, well, once I'm in the desert, there's nobody there. Um, and if they don't know I'm there, they won't mind. So that was kind of my plan, um, was to sort of secretly sneak across this desert. Um, and the last thing I should just say before we get going is that when I was doing a bit of practicing around the edge of the desert, I found there were a lot of reeds at the edge where there was more water. And the reeds punctured the wheels of my cart, which was a bit of a big problem. So I decided actually I would leave the cart here. I left it at one of my early caches. And for this first 200 kilometers or so, I'd be walking with just a rucksack with more caches. And then I'd pick up the cart and go deeper into the desert. So that was the plan. And I think I was actually very surprised that I'd managed to get ready. In just four months, I'd gone from nothing to being ready to attempt the first solo crossing of the desert of death. Um, I was very, very nervous, but I think something that really helped me to get ready, I, I was reminded of this recently the other day, I, I saw a documentary about Warren Buffett, you know Warren Buffett, second richest guy in the world, in this documentary he makes friends with Bill Gates, richest guy in the world, and one day somebody gets them both to sit down, gives them both a piece of paper, and says to each of them, write down the one word which is the secret of your success, and they both wrote down a word, and showed it, and it was the same word, anyone know what it was? could be prepared. Actually, the word was focus. Well, that was really interesting, focus, because these guys must have a million things to do, but they focus on the most important thing. And that's their secret, they said. Um, and I, I realized that I managed to do that, because I, basically, because I had a goal. Having a very, very clear goal has many, many benefits for us. One of them, I think one of the key ones, is it allows us to focus on what we're really, really trying to do. And I had this very, very clear goal, which was I want to be the first person in history to cross the Taklamakan Desert on my own. And, and I, I think behind that goal, I wanted to overcome my insecurities, and I wanted to prove to the world, and maybe prove to myself, that somehow I'm exceptional. I wanted to prove I was exceptional. So that was a, a kind of big driver for me. Um, another driver, kind of the other way around, a sort of a different sort of driver to help me get ready, um, and it actually encouraged me to set off, um, was, I, I was in, very inspired, I often thought, think about this quote, you might have heard of it, by uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And he says, um, it's not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, nor where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. Who, at the best, knows in the end the triumph, the triumph of high achievement, and who, at the worst, if he fails, at least fails whilst daring greatly. And it was that last line just kept going through my head. You're going to try and do something big and tough, but it's better if you dare to fail greatly. It's a great kind of, I'm going to dare to fail greatly. I'm going to go for it. I don't want my life just to be full of easy things. I'm going to dare to fail greatly. So let's go. So off I set. I couldn't really believe I was setting off. And to be honest, I thought it was very highly likely that I would fail. Um, but I set off with my rucksack. Initially, there was a gravel plain at the edge of the desert. To my south, I could see the southern Silk Road which I was gradually walking away from. And can you just see that, um, just that shadow there? That's the Himalayan mountains, about 100 kilometers away, rising up out of the desert. And um, I was walking away from that into the desert. It was exceedingly hot in August. It was 38 degrees the day I set off. I had one umbrella to keep me out of the shade. Um, and I was just roasting alive right from the beginning. I was so, so hot, um, gulping down my water, getting very exhausted. 
um, getting blisters on my hips from the rucksack, blisters on my feet. My rucksack was weighed about um, 30 kilograms, which is like one and a half check-in bags at the airport. It's a very, very heavy bag, uh, taking letters. And you can see the dog there, so there's a, you can just see the edge of a farmer there. Um, they thought I was like an alien who just sort of <laughs> in the sky, wandering through their farms, where, where on earth did I come from? Um, and um, little farmhouses. And something else interesting is that there, there were rivers coming down to the edge of the desert which were being redirected into these farms. So very unexpectedly, a lot of their land was flooded at the edge of the desert. So I started having to walk through these kind of swamps and it was like a maze. I just got lost in this sort of swamp, swamp land and farmland. Really, really hard work. Um, sometimes having to wade through little rivers um, but then uh, I, was, I was very happy one day I saw this uh, big truck by the uh, side of uh, a farm and, and I got up to it and this guy um, was there eating a melon and I said, oh, what are you doing? He said, I'm uh, taking melons from the farm down to Guangzhou. I said, oh boy, almost back to Hong Kong. He said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm you know, walking across the desert. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, have a melon. So he gave me a melon, so that was good. Um, and um, I've now made it um, almost through that first two weeks with the rucksack. But before I got to my cart, I had one um, big obstacle, which was a river, the River Chartan, which was the kind of biggest river in the area. And I had looked at, studied the satellite maps, which I downloaded on my phone, and it didn't look too big a river. And I thought, well, hopefully, you know, I'm hoping it won't, you know, it's a, a, a desert, how deep can the river be? Hopefully I can just wade across it, won't be too bad, won't be too fast. Um, this is what I found when I got to it, um, uh, which was not really part of the plan. And I very nearly decided just to, I, I don't know, I had to somehow walk, just walk along it. And, um, I didn't know how to cross it. Then I remembered I had some empty water bottles in my rucksack, the water gun. They can act as a float. So maybe I could, I emptied out half my rucksack. I'd be able to uh, swim across it with my rucksack as a float and half the stuff and swim back and kind of swim back and forth with my empty water bottles making my rucksack float. But before I did that, I thought I'd better just swim across it once uh, without any rucksack just to check I can actually get across. So here's the video to show you what happened. Well, I'm in a real dilemma here. Um, the river is more flooded than I thought. I attempted just to try and swim to that mud flat. But the rapids are a bit worse downstream, so I wouldn't want to get sucked into those. I've got to say I'm more inclined to say no at the moment. separated my stuff. I'm going to take it across, across in four or five loads with lots of, um, I, I got a lot empty, um, several empty water bottles I've saved for this so that the bag will still float. swimming backwards and forwards 12 times across that river to get all my things across. So quite an ordeal. But I was so happy once I got to the other side. Um, a few days later, I, I made it to my cart. And um, I think, again, just to return to that point, I think having a clear goal gave me courage. I think goals give us courage. We really don't want to get there. We have the courage to get there. So I got to the cart, I've given the, uh, the cart a name, Odysseus, which seems like a good name for a cart, uh, going into the desert, and we set off walking, and it was so nice, all my heavy equipment and water was now on the cart, not on my back, and it was quite nice the first day, walking into the flat desert, but then the 
dunes started, um, rolling up and down. And I had to develop my techniques uh, for going down. Often I'd just let all this go, and off he went, and I'd run after him. Uh, harder was going up the dunes where um, I had to sort of pull them up and find, it was like a maze. I had to find a gentle slope to go up and down, up and down. And you can see there's quite a steep one. Eventually I got up that, and then I looked out, and I saw that just going on and on and on for basically about 800 kilometers more. Um, pretty intimidating. We kept going, learning how to cross these dunes, some of them incredibly big. Um, I had to try and cover about 12 kilometers a day in order in about a week's time to get to my next cache of supplies. So that was my goal. The first day, second day, third day, I was hitting my 12 kilometers, 12 kilometers, 12 kilometers, um, but getting quite hot and quite tired. And it was on the fourth day in the afternoon, as I climbed quite a big, tough dune, suddenly I felt my legs were just sort of buckling. I just totally had no energy, and I just sat down um, near the top of this dune. And feeling utterly exhausted, my head was starting to spin, and I realized I was actually starting to get a mild heat stroke. I, I couldn't really think straight. I was suddenly um, like in quite a dangerous situation. Uh, the worst thing about heat stroke, when I mean, your, your body grows weak, but your, your mind gets confused, which is very, very dangerous, obviously. Um, and I still had a few hours of daylight, so I could have kept going. I'd only gone eight and a half kilometers, so I was behind, just behind the, my schedule. But I realized I just have to get back to a place where I can think clearly. There's no point keeping going in this state. So I um, just fell asleep there on the dune where I was sitting. And um, the next morning, thankfully, after a good night's sleep and I drank some extra water, my clarity of mind came back which was the most important thing. I realized uh, this is really madness to keep going like this. And I started studying my map again. And I suddenly saw, I hadn't noticed it before, but if I headed south a few kilometers, the dunes got a lot smaller. So um, I, um, I started to head south, um, came, sort of came out of the, off those dunes. There I am, looking unhappy. Um, came off those dunes and, and got to, to a flatter area. And I was able to speed up, get back on track, and make it to my next cash. Um, but it was a lucky escape, if I'm honest. It was quite a, um, a dangerous situation to have got myself into. And I realized that as well as pushing myself hard, you know, I knew I'd have to push every bit of myself that I had into this expedition to succeed. But as well as pushing myself hard, I had to really think about, I suppose we could call it, about my um, personal effectiveness, how I could be most effective in achieving my goal. And that wasn't just a matter of sheer hard work. It was about thinking. Um, for example, I need to, when in the hottest part of the day, take a break, find some shade, and take a couple of hours off in the middle of the day so I keep my strength. I need to take days off when I get to the caches, so I took a day off. I need to structure my day. I need to plan my route more carefully through the dunes. It's not just a matter of going in a straight line and trying to overcome the dunes. I've got to be intelligent with how I try to achieve this goal, not just hard work. And I, I think it's, I kind of reflect, it's the similar um, thing in other parts of my life. Like now I'm, I'm running a business, I'm writing a book, and I'm giving about 50 speeches a year. And um, there's quite a lot of different things going on. So I think, how can I be more effective than that? It's not just about hard work, it's not just about putting in huge long hours, it's about being wise. And something I've become aware of recently is like, how often I check my phone. Um, but you know, the, the research has shown most of us check our phones like between about 30 and 100 times a day now. And uh, Microsoft did a survey where if you're in the middle of a task and you, you get distracted, you know, in a difficult task, and you get distracted and you check your phone, then you go back to the task, it takes 15 minutes to get start concentrating properly on your task. It's incredibly inefficient just the way a lot of us work these days. So there are these various aspects, um, also things like taking breaks. There's research showing now that actually you get more work done if you take a short break every hour than if you just work eight hours straight. So things like that I'm thinking about in the rest of my life. How can I be more effective? And um, So now um, I've made it through the first bit, continued onwards into the deeper desert. My techniques were getting better. I was reading the maps better. Still some hard things like blisters. Um, and there was a sandstorm, but that wasn't, wasn't too bad, actually. Um, and um, 
It was beautiful. It's such a wonderful experience. Kind of the absolute opposite of Hong Kong. You know, we've got people, we've got water, and we've got sand, and we've got no people. But it was actually a really um, lovely experience. I think maybe a lot of us could do with more silence in our life, more um, just time alone. It's a very valuable thing. And, um, and you can see coming down a really big juice. Um, but I, I think alongside having all this time on my own, I went for a, a week or longer sometimes without seeing any kind of sign of human life. Um, I maybe slightly was going a little bit crazy um, uh, from spending so long alone, as I think you will observe in this uh, next video. <laughs> A little bit yellow, but um, not too yellow, so I'm going to dilute it a bit and then try drinking it. Oh. <laughs> I wonder if I should put some electrolytes in it. Might make it taste better. If I didn't know it would pee, it might not be quite so bad, but I feel a sort of retching in me. It's getting all over my beard as well. Oh Tastes like swimming pool water, I guess that's like... <laughs> Bear Grylls drinks that much beer. I think he drinks like tiny little bottles of it. He really has to. Down it goes. It's going to make me go mad. <laughs> Maybe that's because I haven't talked to anyone for five days. Not seen anyone. Six days. Ah! Ooh! <laughs> right! <laughs> it's normal water now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't recommend it. Um, so, um, I'm going a little bit mad, but I was amazed that now I was almost halfway. Uh, well, basically, I was halfway, and I had had a very, very hard time, but I was on track to make it, and I was so. Um, Excited, maybe I'm actually going to make it. I'm going to be the first solo crossing. And uh, what was coming up now? I had another cache, quite a big cache here, um, and then I had a, quite a big empty stretch, um, and then a kind of final stretch. Um, just near to this cache, I should also say, you see here, there's a little river just going into the edge of the desert. There was a village, and I knew I'd have to go around that village without anybody seeing me to get back into the deep desert. So I was a bit nervous, but I thought it should be possible. Um, and I followed the GPS coordinates to my next cache. When I got to the next cache, everything had disappeared. All my food and water had gone. And I realized um, that, because it was quite near to one of these oil roads going through the desert, um, that some road workers must have found it. So I didn't really blame them, luckily them. They found my stuff and they'd taken it. And so all my stuff had gone. Um, and this was a bit of a major problem. I couldn't keep going into the desert. But because I was near the road, I thought there is an answer to this problem. I, so I hid Odysseus, my car, and I hitchhiked the next day. I hitchhiked down um, from there about 80 kilometers south to this town called Nia. And there I was able to buy loads of new supplies, uh, put them in the back of a taxi. Whilst I was doing all this, some police came up and questioned me, but I sort of just said, look, I'm just sort of looking at the desert, that's all. Um, and they let me go. So I went back into the desert with the taxi. The taxi dropped me off. I took the cart and I started walking now the next day to go back into the desert, giving a bit of a wide berth of the village so that I could get back in. But then suddenly, as I was walking along, I looked up and rather, well, completely to my surprise, I was surrounded by police and security guards. And um, I realized what had happened is the 
police had made the taxi driver tell them where he was dropping me off. And then they'd basically sent out a search party to find me. And they'd followed my, you know, tire tracks. Um, and um, suddenly I was caught. Um, and they took me back to the police station. The chief, the sort of regional chief, the um, district chief of police turned up. And he was really not happy to see me. And I was saying, look, I'm just, you know, I'm just looking around the desert. I'm not doing any harm to anybody. Um, just let me go. And he, he said, no, you are not going any further into the desert. It's too dangerous. And I think basically what he meant that was that if I died, he would get in trouble. Um, <laughs> and so he said, you are coming with us. And he put me, plus Odysseus, plus all my stuff. We had three cars to fit everything in, this convoy. We drove down to the town. We drove through the town. We drove across the border of his district into the next district where he wasn't responsible for me, and he dumped me by the side of the road. And he says, don't come back. And to be honest, at this point, um, I felt I, I couldn't quite believe what happened. 48 hours earlier, I, I was, everything was on track. It was very difficult, but I was on track. I thought I was going to make it 48 hours, 48 hours earlier. 48 hours later, here I was. I was on the edge of the desert on the Southern Silk Road. I'd been driven in a car for 80 kilometers, so there was even a gap in my, you know, my footprint, as it were, had been separated now by 80 kilometers in a car, and I was, basically I felt, um, you know, have you ever heard that thing that our brains always try to create a story to interpret the situation we're in. So whenever we have a, 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 a situation, our brain's going to tell a story. And the, the story I was telling myself now was something like this. You set off on a really foolish and stupid and dangerous expedition. You are completely out of your depth. You didn't really know what you were doing. And then through a mixture of bad luck and bad judgment, you got caught by the police, and they've thrown you out, and now you've failed. You are a total and utter loser. That, that was kind of the story I started telling myself. In my head. And I, to be honest, I thought I might as well just give up. Now, it's kind of broken my attempt to cross this desert uh, with this gap. And I thought I, sh I shouldn't just give up straight away. Um, again, I need to... Um, I've got this bad story. I need to, first of all, I need to have a rest. So I was exhausted. So I just went to bed. I hid my tent behind a rock and I had a rest and I slept. And the next morning I felt a lot better. And I think a lot of our emotional kind of struggles sometimes can be solved by a good night's sleep. Um, the second thing I did is I sent a, I had mobile phone reception now. So I sent a message to my five best friends uh, and my wife. And I said, Can you call me? I'm in a really bad situation. And all of them called me out. They called me up. And they all gave me some advice, they gave me some encouragement, they allowed me to think through uh, what I could do next. And then the third thing I did is I realized, um, with especially something my wife said to me, I, I realized I, I need to rewrite this story that I'm telling myself. Um, and I had been focusing too much on that big goal to prove I was special, to prove I was ex exceptional, to prove I could cross this desert. And that really had had fed into this terrible story I was telling myself. Instead, I needed to think more about that quote from Theodore Roosevelt. I want to, to dare what, to, to dare to fail greatly. I want to dare, and, and I sort of had semi-failed now. But my wife said to me, if you've really tried your best, the important thing is tomorrow you try your best as well and you just keep going. So that became my new story. I, I might not succeed with my original plan, but every day from now on I've still got um, you know, half the time left. I can still try and cross this desert somehow, it won't be my original plan, but I'm gonna, every day I'm going to dare to frail greatly and I'm going to try my very, very best to complete this thing. So that gave me the motivation to keep on going. And I had to walk along the Southern Silk Road for about a week. Um, to find a route back into the desert, so I just walked along the edge of the desert. Then I found a, a road going back into the desert here, so it was about um, 200 odd kilometers I walked along the road, came back in here, and now I had this final quarter going back into the deep desert. And this was actually gonna be a very tricky part because um, 
it was an oil exploration zone, which was it was kind of the security. There were like uh, barriers and things on the road going into it, and then I knew there were sort of trucks and things exploring the area to work out where to build the oil wells. Um, and I knew that if anybody saw me, they would catch me and I'd be thrown out of the desert again. So it would like, completely fail the ending. So I didn't want to be caught. So I started to enter this part of the desert at night um, and then uh, so I could hide from people. And then as I got deeper, I thought I could go in the day. Um, so, here, so here's another little video. I've been walking for about 45 minutes in the dark. I've got a, probably an eight hour night walk uh, to do 35 kilometers, which it's not that far, but it's quite hard work at night. And I just saw some headlights coming down the road. I can hear the cars getting nearer, so I've, I've got off the road. I'm hiding. Right, James Bond. I'm not James Bond at all. So uh, I managed to get through, the, get into the oil zone, and I can start travelling in day again. There were just uh, there were this incredible mountain range uh, called the Mazatag Line, which rises. These cliffs rise out of the sand. Very extraordinary. But um, continued onwards, everything was starting to fall apart. My shoes were falling apart. My various electronic equipment was falling apart. My trousers. You can see I had a huge rip on the back, um, and I was just. We were really getting exhausted now for about two months. I'm very, very tired, and I, I was also very paranoid because sometimes I'd see an oil truck in the distance, and I'd have to like, dive down behind the dune and um, they'd drive past and, and I'd keep on going. But it was very kind of stra I felt like I was a prisoner of war or something, like that, sneaking through this desert. Um, and, and, and as I was getting into the final, um, kind of the final couple of hundred kilometers, Suddenly, this motorbike appeared very suddenly on the gravel plain, like this little gravel plain. And, the, and I, I sort of ducked behind my car, but the motorbike came over and he stopped uh, next to me. So I just stood up and said, oh, hi. Uh, and, um, and then another motorbike appeared, then a truck appeared. And we just, I just, you know, oh, it's a nice day, isn't it? And, you know, just, so, you know, tried to make very friendly conversation. They were like, who on earth are you? But we, they were actually pretty friendly. Um, and um, then they gave me a, a melon. And, like, and, so uh, and then a, a guy went back to his truck and thought, what's he doing? Is he going to call somebody? And then he, he came back with a pair of trousers. And he said, yeah, a pair of trousers. Um, so they, they didn't really fit, but I took them anyway. And, um, and then they let me go. So I was so relieved that I, I'd got to, I think they realized now I was getting towards the edge of the desert. It was easy just to let me keep going. And I kept going. And then eventually, um, I came to this track. And I started following this track into the final 100 kilometers towards the edge of the desert. And then I saw some trees, more trees. I thought, wow, this is almost the end. But where is the end? How do you define the end of the desert? Is there a sign saying the end or, or what? And, and I realized um, it will be when, I, when there's some water for me to swim in. I think that is a good definition. I kept going. And then here's the last little video. Well, it's actually quite hard to define where the edge of a desert is. Um, so I was trying to work out where is the edge of the desert. Is it when I get out of the dunes, when I'm amongst the trees, when I get to my first village? And I thought, no, really, it's when I get to my first kind of stream or river on the edge of the desert. And uh, I've just come to one. Um, let's go jump in. across the desert, but we've done it! Woo. Oh my, what a expedition! That was tough! But I actually, I'd ended up finishing a week early um, because I'd had to walk on the road, so I'd speed it up. So I finished a week early and I thought, well, I did my best, I crossed it, that's brilliant. But I've got one spare week before I have to fly home. And if I've really, really, really done my best, I'm still annoyed about that 80 kilometers I missed where my footprints didn't cover. So I thought what I'm going to do is I dumped Odysseus by the edge of the desert for a farmer or somebody to pick up. So some farmer's got Odysseus now. And then I took my rucksack and with just my rucksack 
I, that's where I finished. I hitchhiked, uh, it took me two days, I hitchhiked back to where I'd got, uh, been dropped off by the police. And I thought, I'm gonna walk that section, but this time they're not gonna catch me, because first of all, I've just got a rucksack, so it's much easier to hide than having a car. And secondly, I'm gonna walk it backwards, I'm gonna walk in the opposite direction. The last thing they'll expect is me coming in the opposite direction. So I set off in three, it was really, I was really tired, Three days, I walked with my rucksack. This final section managed to redraw in the footprints, and then I jumped on a plane and I flew home to Hong Kong. And just as we're uh, closing, a few little questions to think about. First of all, did it count? Was that the first solo crossing? I think it counts as a sort of crossing. It counts as a fun and silly pioneering method of sort of crossing, but I don't think it can count as a first solo crossing. So that title is still out there for somebody else to try and get. But um, the other question is, what did it mean to me? Um, what, what did it teach me, this journey? But actually, although I've just been telling you a story about me, this story isn't really about me. It's about you. Because I don't really know anybody in this room. But what I do know about each and every one of you is that your lives have been full of good times, tough times, facing some fears, failing to face some fears, some struggles, some failures and setbacks. You've been crossing your own desert, and I'm not sure where on that journey you're at. It might be you're in a good time at the moment, or you might be in a tough time. But it's a very, very similar experience, I think, life to crossing a, a desert like this. And um, I want to just throw a few questions out here for you to think about. What are your goals? Do you know what your goals are for this year, for your whole life? What are your goals? And I encourage you to write them down. If you don't write your goals down, they're just sort of floating around. You need to write them down to be clear on what they are. But I also add some extra questions like, which of your goals are driven by your insecurities, by you trying to prove things to other people, which actually I've come to think is not a very good driver for us in life. We're just trying to prove something. Have you got any noble goals? I mean, it's good to try and think of noble goals. And also, are your goals hard enough? I didn't just have easy goals in life. Second question. How can you improve your personal effectiveness? How many times a day do you check your phone, for example? Um, do you take breaks regularly? Do you take time off? There's a great app I just got on my phone called Freedom, which costs about $2 a month, but it's very good at blocking the internet at certain times of day to stop you getting distracted. Um, and when you do have a setback, will you remember to rest? Reach out to your friends. Do you know the five friends you would ask to call you if you have a tough time? It's so worth it having them call you. It makes all the difference. And to rewrite the story, that's something we can all do. And then the last question. Do you dare to fail more greatly? Because I think, I for one, and I think for a lot of us, I don't fail enough. And I think sometimes when I think I might fail at something, I don't really try 100%. Then if I fail, I think, well, I didn't try 100%. That's my excuse for not failing. What about if we set ourselves goals, we knew we might fail. Even though we knew we might fail, we put in 100%. And I think we probably would fail more often if we set ourselves those goals. But I think we would fail more greatly. And I think in the end, we would also succeed more greatly. So when I got back to Hong Kong, it was time for the next adventure in my life, um, I think it was uh, and is the most um, worthwhile and exciting and hardest and best adventure of all. Um, which does, of course, become your dad. So uh, there's my little baby. You've been a wonderful year. Thank you very much. Please, another round of applause for the man who crossed the top of my pen.